Hello, can you hear me? We hear you. Who? I can hear you. Hi everyone. Hello everyone. I think we can start. If you are thinking you, if you're looking for another working group, then dear Rip, you're not in the right room, but you, but you're still welcome. So let's start the session now. We got a pretty huge agenda. So um, this is a new slide, the not well. So take your time to read it. If you have any question, you can ask our AD. <laughs> and let's move to the agenda. Um, well, I think you can read what we're going to present. Um, I, I hope, um, Andre, you're ready? Yes. Okay, so if you're ready, we, m we may move directly to your presentation. Oh, so we, we're going to move right away to um, Andre's presentation. Yeah, we, oh, we have already. Uh, we have the note taker. Stu uh, and Stu, they're not here. And I, I see Jim coming. Stu, are you online? I am. Yeah. Perfect. So, Andre, you, you want me to, to show your slides? OK. Um, <clears throat> position updates. Back. Yes. Yeah. So you, you just tell me next, and I, I go to the next slide. OK, so this is implementation update that we are doing with students in uh, Linköping University, Sweden. Next one. So as you all know, the, the group is working on secure drone ID, and the key factor is this hierarchical cost identity tag. Uh, also, now we work on um, authentication draft and um, uh, using DNS as a registry to uh, keep the, the, the drone list. Um, next, please. So um, we have updated our code uh, according to the latest RFC 9374, uh, because before the open heap code used uh, to follow this uh, obsolete uh, now draft about heap hierarchical heat, but um, now the format is corrected. So there is correct number of bits um, allocated for each uh, field as you can see from the picture. Next, please. And uh, last year we have implemented uh, read 32 draft and um, now we have a final RFC published, but there were only minor changes actually in, in formatting and grammar and so on. So there is no much um, changes in the code, uh, but uh, we have been also testing the Bob's uh, Python uh, scripts for generating edge sheets and uh, 
did some conversions uh, to transfer it actually to the XML file and then the, the transmitter code, the Bluetooth 4, 5, and Wi-Fi, and um, started to modify our Android app for that. And you can see the pointers to, to the code repositories where you can get it. Next, please. Um, I see in the line, uh, Bien, so do you want, do you, do you have a clarification question or do you, do you have a question to Henry? Or maybe that's an old hand, an old hand. Yeah. And uh, our observer app is available on uh, Google Play. So we have uh, updated it to the open uh, street maps. So it's not rely, uh, reliant on, on, on Google API anymore. And uh, looking forward to port it to the um, iPhone, I think uh, Open Drone ID announced on its page that they are coming with uh, um, iPhone code. So as long uh, as soon as we publish it, probably we can modify it for, for our purposes. Next, please. So latest work mostly was fo focusing about uh, implementing the authentication and, and DNS uh, drafts. So last year we had the 17th version, and we, now we have a working group last call to the version of 30. First and even more, like five. So there is quite a lot of changes. And uh, as usual, when we're, when you implement, there are some questions and, and maybe unclear things. So uh, hopefully we still manage to provide feedback before the um, uh, final draft will be uh, published. Um, next, yeah. And um, regarding uh, the backend, Historically, we were using like uh, private uh, server backend as well as uh, blockchain-based um, registry, but now we want to go to this um, standard uh, sort of uh, what is working group uh, proposing. So we have been uh, setting up local DNS server based on uh, um, discussions on the mailing list and uh, the latest draft to do to do the testing. Um, and the next slide. So, so we actually fortunately do not have to modify the actual code of um, DNS server. So we can use like bind uh, nine uh, code, but uh, provide uh, some uh, special uh, resource records based on the registries 13 draft. And uh, then, uh, well, it's already running uh, in the test mode and uh, we also tried to access this uh, DNS server that Pop uh, was setting up, but uh, it seems to be uh, not reachable publicly. And one question I have to working group is that, uh, uh, do we have like uh, integration with DNSSEC or is it like going to be handled through uh, other, other means like authentication draft? So, uh, Next I, please. I, 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 that's for the working group. I just saw the, the bind people coming. I just saw the, the the vine people coming. So, I mean, the question is whether uh, we should have DNSSEC or not. So, um, Bob? It's in DKI. And, and we'll be working with that in terms of how far does DNSSEC go down in the tree and the rest of the nest things, which I, I do need to expand some more on, but I believe that belongs in DKI, not in registries. We'll cover that and do my slide. Thanks. Okay. Any other comments? All right. So we had also some challenges when implementing this uh, draft, for example, uh, using different types of uh, um, DNS records and uh, integrating with uh, application. And uh, so far, it's uh, only small scale tests, so it's not clear like if we have thousands of these drones is it like scalable or or not and uh, how big workload it will be for the dns server next and also we were working on updating the open hip uh, code which is mostly useful for command and control draft that we have with uh, bob one of the major challenges is to go in uh, to the latest uh, SSL, open SSL version, because the API is quite different and uh, version one is not supported anymore. For, 
starting from September, so it's quite urgent um, thing. Um, also, we use so-called core uh, emulator to, to do uh, setup and, and test uh, like keep uh, connections and so on. And uh, there was also many changes from version seven to nine. So uh, it was um, a challenge to, to keep it up, but uh, so far we set up a new like Docker platform so that we can speed it up and uh, it kind of works and establishes connection. Uh, but so far there is some problem with data plane. Um, I also saw there was some mails about the changes in the bit uh, code in the Linux kernel, and, and uh, maybe it's related to that. We have to investigate. Um, also, I'm glad to say there is a new HIP version 2 implementation in Python from scratch uh, by Dmitry Kupsov, published in Linux Journal. So uh, welcome to, to download and, and test it. So that's it. Basically, if you have any questions, you can answer. Any comments, any questions? This is yet another example of why we need the test environment so that um, I can do an HDA um, delegation to a university team like Andres and they can then be putting all the stuff in the DNS and then have globally accessible and the rest of it, not as a doing a private DNS. And that is an important next step in how we start getting into deployment. Thank you, Andre, for your work. Thank you. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you. So any other comments known? Um, we will go to the next presentation. Hello. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you very well. OK, cool. OK, uh, let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Govind Singh. I'm working in TII, um, um, Secure System Research Center within TII, and mainly focusing on cybersecurity of uh, uh, cyber physical system, end to end security of the cyber physical systems. So, we started uh, in last quarter, we started work uh, in the context of UTM, which is basically adding the uh, drip importer uh, as part of the surveillance uh, uh, supplementary data service provider. So, I would like to showcase the work we have done in last quarter and what the roadmap what we have in the context of drip. Next slide, please. So uh, we started with uh, ASTM F3411 compliant uh, broadcast rate testbed. So what we have as part of the testbed, we have the broadcaster devices where we have uh, DRI uh, based out of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth LE based uh, radios. And on the observer side, we have the application, which is uh, derived from the uh, open drone ID spec, open drone ID code base. Please, next slide, please. So in terms of the uh, proof of concept, so we have uh, integrated and discrete broadcast read hardware. So in the integrated, uh, we have the mission computer where we have integrated the uh, radio, uh, which is basically not only doing the command and control as well as it is doing the broadcast read operation. So here it is using a long range Wi-Fi uh, and using that Wi-Fi, we are running uh, basically the mesh plus the AP mode. On the access point, we are advertising the broadcast rate. Uh, on the discrete side, we have uh, two proof of concept devices where one, one is uh, having the Bluetooth plus Wi-Fi functionality. Other one is basically network read plus the broadcast rate using the Bluetooth LE advertisement. And it is supporting Bluetooth 4.0 and Bluetooth uh, 5.0 spec. So in terms of Wi-Fi, it is having mainly 11 AC and 11 uh, AX uh, capable chipset. So this is the we have the high level architecture what we have implemented. So we have the uh, red transmit service followed by the radio hall, which is managing the radio. And for, as part of the uh, DRI sec, we have implemented basic signature algorithms for uh, EDDSA, HMAC, 
feature in the uh, DRI payload. And in terms of radio, so we have uh, following uh, radios, which is ESP. Uh, um, uh, few Qualcomm baseband, which are basically giving the long range aspect. So we can even uh, achieve more than uh, four or five kilometers, because if you see the ESP32 and NRF, they don't have the uh, better radio front end, so we cannot achieve the long range. So this is one of the uh, field trials we are doing in terms of the long range aspects, the reliability aspects uh, uh, on the RAID. Next slide, next slide, please. So this is the high level architecture, what we have uh, in the context of the UTM deployment. So we have drone, uh, uh, then we have a uh, ground control station uh, where we have the UTM adapter extension integrated with the Q ground control. So with this UTM adapter, now we have the, uh, uh, you know, basically link to the UTM service provider. And then we have network remote ID link and direct remote ID link using the Wi-Fi Bluetooth as well as the cellular devices for the network remote ID. And as part, as part of the work, what we have done is uh, right now we have created a drip importer uh, within this uh, open UTM uh, stack. Uh, so just to give you the context, uh, so open UTM service provider is basically the collaborative work we are doing with Rishi, uh, Rishi Case Ballal from Open Skies uh, and uh, uh, that is, he is basically leading uh, a lot of things in open UTM context. So this is uh, one of the good initiative, having the open UTM uh, system in the open source community. So uh, later, what we want to do, do is the drip importer, we want to extend as part of the surveillance SDSP. So this is uh, as part of the future roadmap. Next slide, please. So in terms of the uh, SDSP parser, so we have the US, the drone, which is having the integrated or the discrete uh, RID devices. Then we have the observer. So observer side, we can have phone or some of the infrastructure devices, which can basically relay back to the uh, open UTM uh, USSP. So here we have Flight Blender, so where it is implementing flight authorization, network remote ID, conformance monitoring, and the weather services. And we have here the Drip Importer, which is basically currently uh, having the decoder based on the ODID ASTM F3411 spec. So we have operator ID, location, basic ID system, and as well as the authentication data. So this has been validated with some of the data that, that is shared by Adam, uh, as well as the one what we basically locally generated uh, based out of the spec. So uh, this is the GitHub repo uh, where we have right now the drip importer. Uh, so this is the initial work that has been done in the last quarter. And what we want to do in as part of the future roadmap. Uh, next slide, please. So we want to create a uh, drip test bed. Uh, so where we can have a local deployment of the registries, DNS, and then basically whatever the drip importer we have created that we can basically do the end-to-end -end verification of the spec. So uh, right now we are going through the spec and basically trying to digest all of the information that is there and then uh, figuring out how to basically integrate with this, uh, creating the local deployment and then uh, basically uh, contributing back to the community and then uh, uh, giving feedback as part of the spec uh, spec review. Uh, so uh, you can contact uh, uh, to this email ID as well as Rishikesh from uh, uh, Open Skies, who is leading uh, the Open UTM initiative as part of the Flight Blender. OK. Thank you. Any, any question? Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? from the remote participants. That's, oh, I see two. Just want to say thank you very much, Govind, for this work. It is so important that we have independent implementations from Andre, from you, from others. Thanks, thanks, Stuart, yeah. Looking forward to collaborate more and yeah, contribute more. We just started the journey, yeah. So hope like we will. Yeah, that's, um... At least that's um, for the working group. It's really good to have uh, two very open implementations. And we know there is a third one. <laughs> so that's very good. So if there, if there are no, no questions, um, we will move to the next presentation.
which would be identity me. management. Yes, I do believe so. I love managing things. Bob is taking your place. Uh, <laughs> sit back down, Bob. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of the uh, registries document, what's changed, and uh, where we're kind of going. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there's some minor changes since Dash 12. Uh, the document was incorrectly marked as an informational document, so it has been switched over to a standard track after a bit of uh, discussion on the mailing list. Um, along with that, references were updated the architecture has been released up to this point, so RFC numbers were added in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the serial number proposal uh, later in the presentation. Uh, we've had some discussions about uh, the prefix delegation. Um, there was some text added into the IANA considerations to seed that discussion and at least give us kind of a framework to start thinking about it. Um, and then, of course, we added a couple other things to the IANA registries, mostly just keys for the endorsements. Uh, the full diff can be seen from the link. Uh, next slide. So this is probably the biggest item that happened from 12 to uh, 13 uh, and hopefully into 14 um, if the working group approves it. Um, it's the proposal of removing the serial number discussion from this document. So as the moment, this document is titled um, and focuses mainly on debts in the DNS. That is very well defined per the document. We use ip6.arpa, the nibble reverse domain, um, as the apex point and further delegations as we've been talking with IANA. Um, and to look up a debt is a must for interoperability, whereas looking up a serial number is optional. Um, it'd be useful, definitely useful, but it isn't something we need immediately. And adding debt serial numbers into the document uh, created a little bit of confusion because another apex has to be added into the DNS. Um, and we're not sure where that's going to be, who delegates it, who has administrative control, et cetera. Um, so it was kind of more of an orthogonal discussion that kind of got roped in. So a new document uh, personally was created um, to handle uh, serial numbers in DNS. And in the dash 13, there are author notes sprinkled throughout that kind of mark text blocks that would be effectively removed in their entirety uh, to handle this transition. And so I elicit feedback from the working group for it. Um, this doc, this picture here, uh, thank you, Dan, for the next slide, uh, is effectively uh, what you saw in the interim. And the entire dot ARPA tree would be effectively out of scope for the document. Um, only We'd only be dealing with the IP6 dot ARPA domain and the nibble reversing and the delegations of that. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's in progress now in Dash 14. There's a pull request on the GitHub where the document is, and that's where all my changes have been as I've committed them up slowly for the past couple of weeks. Uh, next slide. So the one big thing that has been part of this discussion is a debt resource record. Um, we've gone back and forth a little bit on how we want to handle this. And at the moment, we've landed on the this resource record is a metadata record that contains drip specific information. Um, there are a couple different reasons why that kind of fell back into that state. The HIP resource record handles the public key at the moment, along with reverse lookups. TLSA handles certificates and DTLS support, which Bob is very keen on having for his secure C2 and NetRid work. And the URI is a very common thing so that we can point to well a URI where the public the private information registry is. Um, the debt resource record in dash 11 of the document basically tried to subsume all three of these resource records into one and an argument was made for why are we reinventing things 
just use what exists. So the debt resource record kind of slimmed down considerably and became more specific. As such, that in the Dash 14 version, which is yet to be published, but hopefully will be soon, there's a lot of cleanup in this section. There are subsections added for each field. Um, there is an entire IANA consideration second section for two particular items, uh, the type and status field. And a lot of the examples in the appendix have been updated. There is an open issue on the GitHub. I think it was raised by either Eric or Med on whether or not the debt resource record needed to be its own document. I wasn't sure if that was resolved or not, but I know that we were starting with it in the document to get our thoughts together. Um, and the last line here, you'll see an example of what a debt resource record currently looks like. So it has the debt as a hexadecimal value, a type and status field, uh, an abbreviation field that's basically a text field for the um, hierarchy ID, the serial number, uh, and a broadcast endorsement uh, object. Uh, next slide, thank you. So other changes, um, Bob gave me a big block of text on a C509 certificates, which are CBOR encoded X509s. This kind of ties into his um, ICAO work and he's making good strides and progress on that. So thank you, Bob, for giving me that text. Uh, there was a security consideration section added for public key exposure. This was originally in the auth document, which is in current, currently in working group last call. So I encourage people to review it and make comments uh, on that document. But effectively the PK public key exposure problem was that we realized in the auth document, exposing the public key too early could could potentially get you to have an attack vector, mainly that a private key could be forged, especially if we were using small keys. Um, we started the discussion in auth and realized it needed to be in registries. So the text has been adapted and moved into registries and removed from auth in the latest version of auth. Uh, I think it went right before working group last call. Um, and then uh, I added an appendix for the hit abbreviation. This particular piece of text is moved around. It was in the body of the document, then ended up in the um, uh, notation section, and now it's in the appendix. Well, it ended back up in another section of the body of the document, then it ended up in the appendix. Um, Stu raised an interesting point. I think it was privately to me. I don't know if it actually went public but I'm raising it here now. Um, and that is if we're unsure if we're touching into the client domain, a lot of the text in this particular section is kind of recommending or telling a client how they should format the string that they represent an aircraft using a debt. And we became a little conflicted, at least amongst the two of us, which way, it, whether that's even in scope. So it was moved to the appendix and I have weakened the language uh, to see if that rectifies anything and if it breaks anything. So comments on that would be more than welcome. Uh, next slide, please. So I have a couple open issues that are left. Uh, IANA registry for RAA values. Uh, this was actually addressed in a small side meeting that happened yesterday that I think uh, Jim is going to chat a little bit about later. I have a slide that I was basically going to throw it to Eric. Sorry, Eric. Um, the CERT resource record usage, I believe it's deprecated, but we had some stuff about ODIDs and, or OID allocations and doing CBOR and a CERT resource record. I don't know if that is valid anymore, especially considering the TLSA records in play. And then there was a lot of open issues from the OPSTER and the DNSTER reviews. Um, I think a lot of them were fixed in Dash 12, so they might just be hanging issues that need to be closed, but we might want to have someone review them very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, or um, do Bob, do you want to? Bob has um, is in Yeah, we'll just stay here for Bob's thing. It's um, yes, the CERT rate resource record, um, cut that out. It's deprecated. We're going to cover it much better with the debt resource record. So... Yeah, yes, yeah. so it was a good starting point, but we need to do our own one. And Jim showed us how easy it is to do it. So 
Excellent. Put it All out. Right. All right, that's fair enough. All right, so that can close a number of issues. Uh, so this is the uh, hold slide that I had put in for Eric to come and talk about the DNS prefix del delegation because we talked to Ayanna. But I believe, at least from the conversation earlier, that Jim might be making a presentation on this. Can chairs confirm or deny? <laughs> OK. Uh, and then otherwise, I'm done. I, anybody have anything, questions, comments, concerns, and discussion on the uh, draft? Comments are always welcome. Please email me. I, I, am, I don't bite. At all. Oh, it's at the right height. Thank you. Okay, we had a short site meeting yesterday uh, to try and sort out one or two issues that have been left dangling, where various people had various bits of the picture, but nobody had a complete picture of what was required to be done here. So we're happy to see they've got all pretty much all this stuff resolved. And first of all, I would say is very much thanks to Kim and his colleagues from Ayana because they've said that we can proceed with the delegations for this because the prefix has already been set aside. So we don't need to go back to the ITF leadership and get some special thing done there. And also that IANA is very kindly going to operate the registry and the DNS infrastructure for the debt prefixes until such times as IKEA is going to a position to ultimately take control of this because eventually that's where operational responsibility and organizational responsibility will rest. But it will take IKEO quite some time to get to that particular point and get a budget for it. So until such times as that gets sorted out, happily, IANA will sort of fill in the breach there. Um, we decided that we needed to have a designated expert to review the delegation requests, which we think are going to come from the National Aviation Authorities. And I didn't duck quickly enough, so Eric decided that I will be this designated expert. Um, uh, thank you to the work that Adam had done earlier on. We've decided that we now know how to do the mapping of the debt numbers into these IPv6 addresses. There's an outline of that in the current version of the registries draft, and that will explain how we can essentially have this done on a country by country basis. And there's also some chunk of that address space or serial number space, which can be set aside for ex experiments. And that will also deal with the problem that Robert had been talking, Bob had been talking about before about trying to proceed with interoperability testing and all of the rest of that. So we can take care of that. There's one action on Bob, which is to go back and to talk to the folks at AKO, probably solo, because whenever these delegation requests come in, say from the FAA or whoever, somebody needs to go and talk to AKO, who can then talk to the relevant National Civilization Authority to say, we've had a request for this prefix delegation. Do you approve? Yes or no? Is this the designated contact for that in your country? And that's only something that the folks at AKO could do for us. We don't know how to do that. Neither would Diana know how to do that. So this model broadly follows what's being done for ENAM, for anyone that can remember that from about 20 or 20 odd years ago, where you've got somebody acting as an intermediate to deal with the registration requests. And we're also dealing with an international treaty organization to make sure that the allocation of what is fundamentally a national resource is handled in a careful and sensitive manner. And that point of contact I, at Ikeo still has to be figured out. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't solo, but that's me just pressing a, a personal opinion. And so with that, I think we've pretty much got this thing done. At the moment, I've still to write up some notes from this particular meeting we had yesterday. And I think we'll certainly have to write up this notional procedure here about how we deal with this, just so it's not left with institutional memory. I think what we did with this, the situation with Enam all those years ago, there was memos of memorandum of understanding that went backwards and forwards between the same parties, between the involved parties. So probably we'll do something similar to that this time. But certainly we will document this so as a clearly understand procedure and the roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. And with that, I'm going to shut up and take questions. Are there any questions um, on the floor? Maybe I have one for Kim. 
I'm just wondering if everything is clear for from the INA point of view, or if you need anything uh, to, to be clarified. Just to make sure that we we understand the same thing. <laughs> I hope we do. I mean, I th we had a constructive discussion yesterday. I think Jim's summary was on point. Um, there's a few implementation details to work out, yeah, but in broad strokes, um, you know, IANA is happy to to host these certainly in an interim capacity, um, assuming at least initially it's low volume. Uh, we're here to be helpful as best we can. Obviously, we administer IP6.ARPA as our normal um, business, so this would just be tacking onto that. Um, and then over time, we can explore ICAO's role and how that evolves. Um, but uh, if we run into obstacles, we'll certainly bring it back to uh, the group. Okay. Yeah, thanks Thank for that. You, and just to reinforce that, Kim, that you said yesterday that if we're going to have a high turnover in terms of registration transactions for this thing, IANA would probably need to look at trying to automate it rather than dealing with it by hand. But since it's likely to be done by hand, because we're not going to get very many of these in a short space of time, that's probably good enough. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, until we know the ongoing transaction volume, we start small and we'll, we'll grow into it if, if the circumstances demand it. Yeah. In other words, we'll make it up as we go along. And now, Bob. No. <laughs> ah, too late. <laughs> Okay, um, the drip debt key infrastructure draft of DKIs and PKIs. So let's go on. Why did I do this? Because I tried to implement a test environment based on the registry strap and I couldn't. Well, there were a lot of unknowns and there were no tools to make the stuff. And there were potential security risks as I started looking at how we were organizing the levels in the uh, endorsements. Um, and this came apparent as I started working through the actual use. So I started, as I started laying things out and trying to make things, I said, I need to document all this. So that's, so to next. And thus I visioned two documents that dime technical matters is in the drip registries. Um, it has a likely endpoint for publishing. We know what you have to do, what it has to be in there. But when we get to actually how to implement it, that's going to take some work. We're going to have to do testing. We're going to have to work with various agencies then to see what works and what doesn't work. This is going to take time, and we don't want to have our technical document being held up by working out the actual deployment. Um, so, but at some point we will get done with it. We'll have things deployed and we'll say that the, this document is done good enough for historical records. Uh, so that's why I envision that we do need these two documents that the DKI needs to be a separate document and that's been documented. Next. So what are my objectives? It was, what does it take to deploy debt support? Uh, present a full debt endorsement trust tree and adult and, and alternative development strategies. So look at such things as we don't want to have the, um, the endorser um, to be um, in terms of what's exposed for attack, typical PKI issues that you have an issuing issuer CA, which, you, which is constantly being hit on and constantly attacked, but it is signed by a CA, which is in a locked safe. Um, and rarely ever taken out. We learned this painfully with X509, and I need to follow the same model here. Then we have the problem that IKO is not going to be able to fulfill its apex role till there is pressure, to be, to be frank, that there's actual people doing things, and then IOCA says, now we need to get the funding and do this. So we just like for their um, PKI that they're doing for um, for um, commercial aviation, 
where they're cross-certifying, they can't do the bridge yet. We need to do a similar sort of thing initially here and get things going and then ICAO can say, okay, we understand what to do and here's how we're going to proceed. So I need alternate deployment strategies, which is, which is in there. Then I have various vendors who for, for, for air to air and air to ground um, and interacting with, with uh, um, general aviation, civil aviation, they want X509. They do not want our neat little, uh, neat, tight endorsements. So I've defined a shadow, actually two separate shadow PKIs based on two different profiles in there. Because uh, many of them will prefer to have certificates and then I can be compatible with the IKO certificate policy. I can put these properly into their certificate policy and how that will go in a legal framework. So I have the light PKI and the PK, P, PKIX light profiles in there. And then finally, um, even with, with this, um, what we want to do for air-to-air -air communications, sending X509 certificates, even these which are like 300 bytes long are too big. And so I've been working with the uh, um, Seabor group with, with Cozy um, on the C509. Um, we even got some changes in their, their draft. We talked about that to, earlier today to cut down the overhead on, on these air-to-air -air transmissions to, to uh, um, and, and it's a significant amount which I'm squeezing out X509 ASN1 encoding versus Seabor encoding. Uh, next. And then the DNS deployment, as we've mentioned just a little while ago, um, using the, um, the IP6 ARPA tree and, and, uh, and, and a hit forwarding tree that I actually need to, to deploy a test RA. I need to deploy, and we just, we just heard from, from Andre that he has a private um, DNS. It's not publicly available in the rest. If I had this done, I can say, Andre, for your university, here's your HDA, go ahead and work with it. For, for, for Hershey and, 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 and go to say, okay, here's yours. So they can have their delegation, they can be doing their work and, and we could all uh, work with their stuff as well. And the final thing is that I didn't know how to generate these things. How do I actually look at these things? So I had to learn Python. And so if you look at my Python skip, scripts and you can make them better, please do. <laughs> because I don't really know Python. So I've, I've created a debt generation um, script. I generate the various DNS records. I generate the endorsement, um, the initial effort in that. So I can say, what do these things actually look like? And I'm gonna have to now work with Jim. So, so we have this, uh, what textually the, the debt resource record looks like, but I want to make it right now a type record. What exactly is that content so that we can put a type record into DNS right now so we can start testing with that. So this is how we now start working and documenting this deployment testing environment. Next. So fine, I've done this work at testing. How does this relate to the charter? I want to make this a work group document. So DIP registries, in my opinion, is inadequate to deploy is technically correct and inadequate to deploy. How many times have we heard that in the IETF? Uh, more is needed as shown in the DKI draft. Uh, and we need to interact with the IKO PKI. Uh, if we want to have, you know, to look at our, our international legal standings, we want to be well connected with, the, with what IKO is doing. And then there's what ASTM and various A2X work groups are doing and what's called certificate-based broadcasts. So in terms of, of working in this larger arena and being relevant, um, the, I feel that the charter does have a place. Next slide. I, I, just, um, I just have a, one clarification yeah, yeah. question. Um, I mean, if we interact with uh, IKO or PKI, do we have someone from IKO involved with that? Um, I'm kind of the contact there. I'm, uh, it, that, that's the trust framework panel. And both Stu and I are experts on the panel. Um, it takes quite a bit to, be, to actually get on the panel. Um, and um, right now, the certificate policy is rather closed. Uh, FAA and Eurocontrol are busy restructuring the certificate policy. So there is a, the 
policy portion, the, the guidance portion is one document, and then have multiple technical solutions. So then we'll be able to have a, um, the, the uh, IKO certificate profiles and be able to have the, the DRIP certificate profiles. And, and so then I'll actually then have to write a certificate policy at some point for this. But that'll be like a year out that I actually do the certificate po policy to fit underneath there. So that's how we're going to inter interact. They're rewriting their current certificate policy and being able to break it down. And then we write our certificate policy for ours and it just will slide right in. Um, we, we have a roadmap basically. Yeah, one further I would say clar clarification question about the slides. When you, um, you, you say that the, um, the current registry is, is, I would say, inadequate to deploy. For me, this is, this is really a, a big warning I see, for the uh, registry. Do you mean that the current specification in its own cannot be implemented and deployed for the purpose which is set by the draft? Or do you mean that the full registration system cannot be deployed? Because, because if, if this is, it cannot be de deployed as currently in the, in the um, I would say, drawing the specification edited by Adam, that means that we cannot progress that document from my point of view, because this cannot be deployable. So can, can you please clarify that no, point? Because the, it the, is really important. In the, uh, the, the registry's draft, it shows three levels of, uh, of endorsements. And, and, and theoretically, that is all that's needed. But... In practice, the apex is not going to be here for some time. So that means we have to, from the second level, have trustless for the second level. Not that we're saying that it's wrong to have the apex, but we we're not going to get there for probably two years. So until we have the apex, how do we operate? We're going to have to have a trustless of the RAs. Second thing, it shows the, uh, the RAA, uh, well, actually the HDA, just being having, creating, um, um, UA certificates. But when you actually do the deployment, if you have only one level there, you have this one level exposed all the time. If it's compromised, then you have really no, you, the only way to move forward is go back to the RA to reissue for the, for the HTA. So instead what you do in, in, in actual deployment is that the RA signs an HTA in, uh, uh, level but then the HGA signs a level underneath it, which is the one which actually then signs the clients, and that's documented in, in the DKI. So in theory, what's in registries is proper, but when you actually, and if you look at any real PKI deployment, there's this other level that gets slid in there uh, because of the potential, potential risk of compromise and how you recover from a compromise. So I don't know in terms of that, and it was, you can blame me for, for not saying, wait a second here. Uh, and, but, and it's again, it's like when we do these things, we do these things in PKIX going back 20 years, you no know, PKIX never documented, this was always how we implemented it, sort of thing. Uh, so that's why I said in PKIX, we never documented this. So why am I going to document it here in, in, in the registries? It's more, this is, how we, this is how we have learned painfully to implement things, because that's kind of a long answer. For those of us who've lived X, on PKI and X509, we have the, uh, um, this, the, uh, um, the booms on that. Okay, so in particular, the, the chair says leverage internet standards and infrastructure as well as domain name registration business. Um, so, so what are the DNS resource records in what domains? Um, that's the question, how we actually put that in. Registries has pieces of that. Um, PKIX used by others, um, and, and um, so how do we um, um, how how do we work with our particular endorsements? Map those endorsements to the X509 used elsewhere in the world. So how do we do that that mapping sort of process? Um, and or, or require existing protocols to be extended. So we have DRIP certificate X509 profile to be integrated with IKO certificate policy. And I don't see that, again, that that belongs in registry. This is operationally how we integrate, but the, the, the chart in my um, reading of it says, yes, this can go into the charter. So that, that's my reading of the charter and why I say we can indeed adopt this as part of the work 
the uh, work group um, for documents. And think, do I have another slide yet? So the value to the work group adoption, content and drip DKI will be used outside of ITF. As I said, IKO, PKI, RPAS, UTM panels, ASTM, and the various uh, UTM um, UAS industry groups. Um, the industry has mat matured since DRIP started. We need to stay current and stay relevant. Um, and we need to inform DRIP registries um, of needed tech content. So um, that's why we need to uh, adopt this um, on to the next one. One more, I think. Uh, so start out as live record implementation. Um, as, you know, we have people who are actually testing drip code. They have to be able to put entries into the DNS. We need to set things up so they can. Um, and then, so, uh, so adopt this as a support document. Um, and then whether we publish this in RFC will be determined some, sometime in the future. Uh, that I think completes my slides that I have on this. And I, I am calling that this, doc, this document be drafted by the work group. Um, and and go, so I can go forward and get out there and get people to use it. So everything is a responsibility for, for DRIP. Regarding the adoption call, I think we need to talk with the chair and read whether it fits the, the charter. Right, no decision taken, but I will not take the decision right now. Uh, so I think everyone can understand this. Um, support document, why not? Because I think it's, we still have to gain operational experience on this. The protocol are not yet fully defined, right? So if we cannot publish something or something we don't have as personal experience yet, if it's an operational document. So having a support document that leaves either is a draft or is a wiki page somewhere, then that's perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah, it's the politics of the naming of our drafts. It's, it's not a politics, right? we, we need to, to follow some process. So it's right, not right. really politics. No, when I go to, to ANSI, and I'm talking about with, with, with ANSI to have the you know, draft IETF, not draft Moskowitz, makes a, a very, very important um, statement. Agreed, but we have process we need to follow. Yeah, so, so, so let's, let's, let's get the process going, kind of a thing. Any other questions? Any I made quest the time on that one. Any questions? Any comments? So. I don't see any. Okay, my next slides. The future. Future. The future is now. Right. Let's move in with the industry. <laughs> um, I'm getting visibility outside the ITF. I've been presenting this talking in various venues and people are looking at what we're doing here. We are being seen, we are late. There's already stuff being put out and uh, um, people are, are seeing the attacks against what was done. That's totally spoofable. You can get an ESP32, put um, code on it and you can pretend to be any UA you want to be and, and do some, uh, some unnice things. So where I'm marketing DRIP as being reputation protection and some of the uh, the larger players are very interested in protecting their reputation that nobody else can be them because of how we've done the trust model here. Um, but we need to stay relevant as the industry matures. Um, we need to get to network remote ID. That was mentioned in an earlier pre presentation. Um, it's also the focus of other CAAs, um, UK, others. They all want to do network remote ID. But there is no standard for network remote ID. They're all proprietary point solutions. This USS does it this way. This USS does it that way. There is no document open standard for it other than what I have started to do here in my document here. This, will, this document gives us then a standard way to do network remote ID and how to do command and control in an open standards method. Um, IKO, RPAS, UTM, and others, um, US, um, um, and we, 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 again, the, um, the presentation we had before, they were taking the broadcast RID and they were importing it into the UTM. Um, my document, there are actually a number of 
products out there that all do this in various proprietary methods of how to do a, a, a surveillance service provider. And what I've tried to do here is an open way of how to create a, 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 a broadcast RID um, surveillance service provider to collect that data and feed it. How good is the UTM if you don't get the data into it? So how do we get that data into it? So these two documents I've had here for a while and they have got attention outside and people are indeed looking at them. And this is where we need to be again to be relevant on how it's moving. Next slide. There's more relevant issues. And that is that um, a year ago, ASTM spun up yet another work group, device to device certificate based communication security framework for US and UAM. That's the name of work group 84631. And there are three um, options and how to do this. Um, there is one based on IBE. There's one based on IEEE 1609.2 certificates. And there's one based on draft draft Moscow script A2X ad hoc session. So we're already in that discussion, but so this time is already getting looked at outside the ITF and we need to get our input into what I'm doing here. Am I doing it right? The rest of it. And we need to have a discussion because this is ongoing and there is a tomorrow an A2X stakeholders call that I'm going to be on. I'm going to miss the, the IETF plenary. It's been doing the IETF plenary. And there's going to be a number of, of people on that. And in there, where they're talking A2X, they're again, these basically these three proposals on how to do it. And we want to be relevant in this discussion and, and how we're going to, going to play in that. And then and then beyond just air to air from ATX, but then air to ground as well, and my other document. So I have been been coming up with with how to do things based on how the industry is moving, and I request and, and plead that this become work inside the IETF as standards work, so that we stay relevant to how this industry is maturing. On, I think that's it. Um, oh, there's there's more. Um, there is a privacy concern that, that more and more people are raising issues about, and I've, I've come with a solution on that, and I've been um, working on, on in there. And finally, Thursday, I'll be presenting my, uh, uh, my A to G draft on there as well. So um, those, those are some, again, the, the work which I've, I've done here, and I've not done this just for the fun of it. I've done this because I'm actually working in the industry and they want to do things. How do we in the ITF present solutions for what they want to do? So again, staying relevant. Can new work to stay relevant in UAS UTM fit in the current charter? Or do we need to revise the charter? Eric, Ned, Sorry, I jumped the queue. Revise the charter. Uh, it's not up to me to decide, right? That's up to the working group to decide and then to be approved by the ISG. So don't point at me. Yeah. Point at you, meaning the room. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, but this is to, in, in my participation in the wider framework. These are sorts of things that we need to do. Now, how do we do them? And to come back on the revised charter, one point important for the ISG to decide whether we can extend the charter is whether there is more than one person writing the draft. Right? It was kind of the, the problem uh, of DRIP. Yeah, I can't it's not the only working group in this case, but that's not a good sign somehow. Yeah. And congratulations for the, the few authors, right? Hershey, are you on the call? Are you on, on there? Open skies. <laughs> Uh, no, there, there are a couple of vendors I'm talking to, and if I can get them to, to come forward. Um, I'm, no, I'm working on some, some vendor-specific applications. I'm under NDA with three separate vendors, um, and, and it's a question of how I can get them to come forward and actively participate in, in the open part of it. And I'm very frustrated because I'm, I am under NDA, specifically with some vendors and how they implement things. So now i got to get them to participate. That would be probably a, a, a big chance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but it's, I mean, one of the vendors has actually presented in ASTM how, how they're doing it right now in the direction they want to go to. So maybe we can get them to more actively play. But they're bit too busy doing their um, proof of concept development right now down in uh, Texas. So their, their attention is elsewhere. Mm. Okay. So, okay, so, so that's my, we're the future. These, these are in, in my participation. And if anybody else has any other input to it, I'm, no, I, I'm not the only, hopefully, I'm hopefully not the only one who's sticking their, their nose outside of, of here or stick, trying to stick your nose from outside into here and what we need to do. But uh, um, this, this, the other one closing thing I want to say is that the thread which has been going for the past five years is that the future of air traffic control is unmanned, uncrewed aircraft traffic management. UTM is the future of ATC. So we really have a chance to be really, really relevant in the total aviation framework and how we, what we do here. Thank you for, right. for, I would say for your continuous effort for, for, for yeah. uh, promoting some work in the brief. I think it's, it's the same situation we had last time in the interim meeting we discussed with the working group that we need to, I would say, to have more people come in and I would say trying to contribute so that we can have something that will be a collective work. I know it's it's really difficult from its standpoint, but we need to do to do that so that we make sure that the what we are doing here in the ATF is for the benefit of I would say the community and not only for some individual yeah. and some some vendor. So I'm yeah. hoping that the meeting that's gonna be in December, I can uh, knock a couple heads. Yeah. So just, just please let them let them go to the mailing list, send messages there, explain I would say with the motivation why they want to support some of the work, mm -hmm. and then we can we can take it there. Okay, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. But that's very interesting that you're re re reaching out the larger community. That's uh, really much appreciated. I think we're done. I don't know if we're late or on time, but um, roughly. So we are roughly good. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Alors, je vais le laisser ouvrir.